district has a mandate to bring additionality to our business area, but this extends beyond the physical. And so this series of events helps us to bring you expertise and knowledge that we believe will be useful to you and help you to flourish, not just survive. Leadership is today's topic, and I don't intend to steal Kevin's thunder, but I will say that leadership for me is one of the most important elements of this experience. Without strong leadership, there is nobody to lead us through these darker days. You will all have your opinion around how government is performing, but we must also look to ourselves and ensure we are providing the right leadership to our teams and our communities. As I said, we have a number of these panel events. All the topics, dates and times can be found on our website, so please do check it out. Uh, CornwallBusinessDistrict.com forward slash events. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our Kevin, our, sorry, our host, Kevin Johnson, who I have had the pleasure of knowing for over 15 years. Kevin is the MD of Urban Communications, and in my experience, he always brings a high level of insight and commentary to any event. So please enjoy. We have some great speakers today. Thank you, Nick. No pressure. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you to you, Nick, to, uh, to Chris Brown and the team at Cornwall Business District for putting on uh, this series of events, the recovery, first recovery event that Mark Reeves hosted, uh, featuring yourself, Nick, and others. Uh, and uh, these three events that, as Nick says, build on that today on leadership and in the future on homelessness and transport. Uh, I do hope you'll contribute along the way. If not, it's going to be a very lonely experience for the four of us that you can see. Uh, do that on the, the chat and we'll pick up questions, uh, certainly at the end, if not to, uh, before that. Uh, and also on Twitter, if you're on such a platform uh, where the hashtag is BHAM Recovery capital B, capital R, BHAM Recovery is the hashtag, and Cornwall Bid, which is at Cornwall Bid, uh, will be tweeting out as we go. So do join in there as well as uh, on here. You have uh, alongside me, as it were, in a virtual sense, uh, three panellists. Uh, you'll have read about them, I'm sure, on, on signing up, so I won't sort of overdo their biobs, but we have Yatunde, who is from Charles Amland. Uh, Louise uh, from Common Purpose and Imi uh, from who of course came to great flame, fame in Birmingham as one of the co-founders of Impact Hub and now doing uh, lots of other things, uh, much of which I'm sure we'll pick up as we go through this session. Uh, I just thought what I'd first do before I go to our panel on the agenda is going to be first, uh, is pick up on a couple of the takeaways that I took out of the last session where I was just a, an audience member listening in to, uh, to Nicola and Ian Ward and many others who are on that call. Uh, the takeaways, I suppose, were six and seven for me, and, and let's see where these might, might play through into leadership today. It was the hope that coming out of this terrible experience, uh, there will be some positives, and it will be a route to zero, a route to uh, uh, carbon net zero, uh, and a sort of supercharging of sustainable transport, Odd at the moment, of course, as we try and keep off public transport, but the hope is beyond all this that uh, we'll be supercharging more sustainable transport and uh, supercharging our aim towards a net zero economy. Of course, the explosion of digital for things not least including this, and of course for online shopping, but a feeling that there is still a need for shared experience of uh, shared experiences, physical experiences, just before. We came live on this uh, webinar. Louise was, was saying how much she misses the sort of coffee and chat and no doubt a croissant that we might have been having if this was a physical meeting uh, in the old world. Uh, the hope that there will be greater creativity and greater use of public spaces, particularly the social distancing in mind. Uh, the point that Nicola made last time is that mental health has shot even further up the agenda for many employers and leaders. Uh, but, but hopefully, and I'm sure this is true, particularly in Birmingham, that we appreciate the value of public service workers, uh, all kinds of people, bin men and all sorts of people, uh, care workers and volunteers, even more than we did before we went into COVID-19. We'll see whether some of those issues we might pick back up as we go through talking in particular today about uh, leadership. Two things I think to frame our discussion with the panel and with all of you joining us today. Uh, one is, uh, what do we need in terms of leadership to help recover, to recover the economy, but also wider society out of this? Uh, and what do we need to help lead businesses? Uh, we need the economy to get back going, of course, in a safe manner, 
what do we need uh, from business leaders and organizational leaders to make that happen, to make it happen quick. Uh, and as many people have said, not to return to what was an old normal, but to return to a better normal. Uh, than, than we faced before those days. I think it was back in March where it feels like a lifetime ago before we got into this this lockdown life that we lead. So that's a bit of framing for our discussion. We're going to hear a brief opening gambit from our three uh, great panellists. Um, the, the same question to them all uh, I'm going to ask them, which is what are three great uh, traits? What are three great characteristics? What are three things that we look for and we hope for in the leaders that we look to in ourselves as leaders. What, what, what might they be? Um, and perhaps what might they be that's different to what went before? Yatunde, give us, give us three oh. thoughts. I know, uh, here you are, you're <laughs> thrown into the line again. So three thoughts on oh, what thanks. makes a great leader. Thanks, Kevin. Um, it, for me, it's been an interesting journey over the last six months. Um, I became head of our Birmingham office at Traz and Hamlin's just in January. Um, and so, and I've been on a bit of a roller coaster because of some personal issues that I, I've had earlier in the year, and then obviously going straight into COVID. And I'm sort of like there thinking, gosh, I've got this office to lead. Um, and I think I've learned the, the biggest thing that I've learned, I think, is about being authentic, um, being yourself, giving something of yourself, especially in a time of crisis. I think people need to see the real you. Um, rather than, oh, it's a leader up there and they don't have any of the problems or experiences that I'm having. Um, so very early on, I did a, a, an office-wide Zoom and I talked about my experience of lockdown and I brought in some of the, the senior um, partners from my firm. And it was amazing. Everybody was like, wow, because I was talking about things like mental health, how I was coping, those kind of things. So I think it's important to be authentic. I think honest communication is key. Um, very early on, I got very frustrated when one of my fellow partners communicated something with good intention, but it was different. And I said, it's not fair because this is a time for worry for everybody. And therefore everybody deserves to hear the same message at the same time to avoid that chitter chatter and people thinking, well, why haven't I been told that? Um, and I think the other thing is about visibility. So. I'm here in my living room, but how can I still be visible? And it's about reaching out to colleagues. So very early on, I did sort of a random ring around. So every day I'd pick a couple of people to ring. And I also asked my fellow partners to tell me about anybody who they thought was struggling, who would appreciate a telephone call. And there's not one person that I've called that turned around and said, do you know what? That was a complete waste of time. It was very much a, oh my gosh, you've taken time out of your day to think about me. So just as I'd walk the floor, whilst I was in the office, I'm walking the floor virtually. So those are my three um, very good. suggestions. Yeah, Tunde, thanks very much. I think you might have stealing some very good thunder from our other two panelists. Uh, they're, they're avidly scribbling away trying to find other things now to say, because you've stolen the best ones. Imi, <clears throat> give us your thoughts on good Hi, leading yeah. strengths. Thank you, thank you, Kevin. And, and absolutely, I, uh, this is sort of building on what Yutunde has said. Um, you know, I really agree. Um, with with lots of things that she said and i think i think when i thought about this question i didn't necessarily think about it just through the lens of um covid i i thought about a few general principles that of course have been strengthened and the the caveat is is i'm i don't i definitely don't think that i'm great at all of these they're things that i'm really working on so i think for, for me the first one is um is and I, I run what would be termed a social business where profit isn't isn't the first and only um, uh, is isn't the only um, main reason and I, I don't have a shareholder board that I have to report to etc. So I think when I talk about this, I talk from that perspective. So um, openness for me is really important. I think one of the things that we've learned in the last three to four months, but um, has always been true for me, is this: there is a place for the things that are ours and the things that belong to us and our personal IP, but the openness of being able to share what you learn and put it out there for people to hack and build on and do the, the, the next iteration is so important because we've got challenges that are 
bigger than any one organization, bigger than any one individual or one career. And we can only, um, as, a, as a city, as a region, as a country, as a world, the only way we can actually tackle the scale of some of those challenges is being radically open. That is um, in, in ourselves and the work that we need to do on ourselves um, about what that looks like. Um, but also what that means structurally with the things that we've got that we can share um, so that we're not all repeating the same tasks over and over and over again in our different offices. Um, and so that's something that's really important uh, to me. I think uh, growth is a second one, a, a willingness to learn, a willingness to say, I've got some new information. I've changed my mind on that or what I thought before wasn't quite what I think now or I, I yeah, I, I definitely, you know, have a different view on certain things today um, and I want to be able to recognize that growth and to be able to constantly um, live within that I think is it's a it's a verb it's not something that you can just say yeah I've, I've grown now as a leader or I've grown now as a person there's constant new information new stories new things or things that we've purposely ignored or been had ignored uh, from us or with, withheld from us and we learn new information and at that point can we take that on and transform our views and transform ourselves um, to, to go on that next uh, journey is I think something that's really important and I guess my my third one um, and this is definitely something that I've, I've learned from family from colleagues um, but what the power of loving well means and I mean this in not just a a a romantic you know love your people or love yourself i mean this in a, in a really transformative way um what does it mean to be able to love it means it's not always uncomfortable it's always it's not always comfortable it's not always romantic it's actually a power between you um and another person or what you're working towards that makes you feel uncomfortable makes you feel interdependent with what you're working towards makes you understand that there is something far greater than um, the thing you're working on or what your um, current challenge is. And starting that from a place of love, I think is really important. That can mean lots of different things. It can be loving people. It can be loving yourself and the internal work that you have to do. It's also about loving the reason why you're doing the work, right? So we'd, we're not just going to work to earn money. Uh, we're not just going to uh, work to earn the most amount of profit for our shareholders. We're going to work for something much deeper and understanding and being able to navigate that um, through times is is what I think really keeps us going and in, interdependent um, with each other. So yeah, those are my early thoughts. Great, Emmy, thank you very much. More of that in a moment. Louise, is there anything left to talk oh, about in terms of traits of leadership? Um, I think there is. I think I. I mean, I'd agree with with everything um, that Yutunde and Emmy has said. I was going to say compassionate, so I'm going to put that to one side because I think it ties in with the kind of love but I think there's a couple that I think are really important um, one is curiosity and that's about constantly learning and not becoming complacent um, and asking questions and asking questions of people who might be outside of your circle or outside of your senior I think it's very easy to think when you've got to a senior leadership position that you should have all the answers and actually a lot of the time you don't know the details so you're not the right person to come up with the answers um, so I think being curious, um, recognizing that you don't have all the answers is important. And that comes hand in hand with another one that's really important to me in our work at Common Purpose, which is collaborative. We cannot solve any complex problems in a city or a place or a society without leaders coming together and collaborating. So whether it's the current focus on social inequality and anti-racism or whether it's reducing homelessness, you can't just solve it with one group of people. So you have to be able to collaborate. You have to be able to put your, your kind of ego and your hierarchy and your um, agendas to one side for the kind of the greater good for whatever the, the social purpose is or the organizational purpose. And I think sometimes people in the private sector might hear me say that and think, well, that, that might not apply necessarily. Um, but I think it happens in organizations as well. You can see silos developing in organizations and people get very stuck on, you know, what their agenda is or what their perspective is and they forget who they're doing it for and why they're doing it. So they forget the purpose. 
And the final one I would say, not the final one, but another one I think is really important is reflection, becoming reflective. So reflecting on yourself, um, your strengths, your weaknesses, how you show up in the world, the impact of your behavior on other people, and to be truly reflective, I think you've got to be open to feedback and you've got to be approachable enough that people give you honest feedback. And I think you've got to continue to do that work and learn about yourself because sometimes you change roles or you change your focus and um, sometimes what got you there won't get you to the next stage. And I think that reflection is a really important piece that a lot of us rush from one project to another, you know, what's my next thing? And we don't stop and either think about what we did well or what we didn't do well. And I think the compassion bit I was thinking of is we have to be kind to ourselves, but we have to be kind to other people as well. So um, I'll leave it there. Right. <coughs> Louise, I'm going to stay with you. Um, I, I ask you all to hold one thought in your mind, uh, as well as the, the next question. That is what, what seems to come out of what you all say is that, uh, the era, if it was ever there, the era of a leader being all-knowing, all-knowledgeable, in command of everything, with all the right answers, uh, with the, they will only tell you the, the, the right way to go. That, that is sort of more and more over uh, as a result of this, this thing. You've, you know, a number of you talked about collaboration and, and uh, about growing and learning and so on, about being authentic. It, it seems that this idea that you've got somebody at the top of the pyramid who's going to know it all and tell you the right way to go is, is eroding as a, as a consequence of this experience. So I'll ask you to reflect on that. But in the, uh, as well as that, start with you, Louise, because you'll look at, you'll work with and look at a, a lot of organisations, a lot of leaders. What, what's been most impressive? I mean, whether you want to name people or organisations, but what, what's been impressive examples of leadership that have stood out to you over the course of this last 13 weeks? Uh, where you've seen an act of leadership, it might be in business, it might be in a social enterprise or a charity, it might even possibly be in the political and public sphere. Uh, wh where have you seen uh, good leadership that's uh, stood out to you and that you, you, know, you might be using in future power boards? Okay, that's, that's an interesting question. I think there's a real balance between what Yutunde talked about in terms of authenticity and showing some vulnerability and showing that you are a human being and that you have concerns and that you are um you're mindful of what everybody else is going through in the organ organization that you work for and also having that balance between um offering hope offering a way forward where you don't have the answer to the questions um so i think there's been some people that have just literally gone into crisis mode and haven't come out of it so they've gone into almost paralysis of fear and uncertainty, which is completely understandable. I'm sure a lot of us were like that at the beginning, but they haven't yet sort of stepped up and stepped out and started thinking about what are we going to reflect on? What are we going to keep that's been really good about this situation? And what are we going to lose? Because actually it wasn't adding value for our staff or for our customers or for our organisations. And then I think there's been other people um, who have very much demonstrated kind of authentic, uh, what I think of as appropriate authentic leadership. And they've been there for their staff and I've heard lots of examples of what people have done for their staff and supported people. But they've also been optimistic about we will find a way forward. And they've been optimistic for the city and the region as well. So I think there's been lots of people kind of going, you know, we will get through this, we will work together. And they've reached out to other leaders and checked in with them. And I know I've done a bit of that and just kind of gone, how are you doing? Because it must be really tough. You know, when I heard that the airport was going to become a mall, I kind of like contacted a few of the people. And I was like, how, how must, I mean, you know, so many people have been impacted in this in, in different ways. I think it's, it's brought out a sense of, um, connection and and humanity in in the best of and the best of a lot of leaders and i think others have just become sort of um a, a little bit stuck in crisis mode i think is probably my main reflection mm. you, you, Tunde, you you mentioned that you've taken the helmet trowers at, at a very interesting time um and maybe you were hoping it started six months earlier but uh, who have you looked to for inspiration to, to try and give you some idea about how to lead A, as you take on a, 
a new leadership position and be as you lead in a very, very strange time. So um, I must admit, I've looked to my board um, and my board, it, it's been interesting in the legal profession, the way in which firms have responded. And there was some day one, you know, furlough, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And to a degree, Charles has bucked the trend. And I was all along, I've been thinking, why, why, why? But it's been quite evident from the communication from the board that, they, you know, they are literally thinking, they're not looking outside and so just reacting because this is what other firms are doing. They've really looked at our specific needs. Um, and so there's some things that have happened. So some people have dropped down to sort of 80% working, 80% pay. And, and we haven't done that as yet. Yes, we've done other things, but at the moment, there's, you know, so I've, I found that honesty really interesting. Again, the communication has been really good. And then I've also looked at other people. So I'm a, an a, a alumni um, from Common Purpose. So again, I've connected with quite a few people through that, which again is good because it's people outside of my um, profession. So the legal profession, everybody's doing very kind of similar things to a greater or less, less degree. Um, but I think it's about what Louis said about collaborative, getting, getting ideas from other people, what are other people um, doing, how are they approaching things, and really looking to see if you can, you know, apply them to your own situation. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, Amy, can I move to you, particularly on this point about collaboration that you tend to be talking about both within the, the firm and, and, and the wider sector and so on. As somebody who's kind of looked at, commented on a lot uh, about how leaders lead uh, pre-COVID, do you sense a greater degree of collaboration, a more collaborative, distributive model of leadership, both from business and, and other parts of society? Do you, does that give you hope that we're going to lead not only businesses but also places in, in, in different ways? Um, uh, yes and, and no. So there's two, there's two sides to this. So I'm, I'm incredibly hopeful um, about the future because I, um, that's, that's who I am, that's, that's what my work is. Um, but um, on the, I'm going to start with a positive because I, I want to kind of like build on that, you know, moments where I've really seen great collaborations and great um, leadership um, and then I'll, I'll say where I think some of the, the challenges with that also will lie. So, so of, of, of my like big political leader hope um, person that I've sort of been looking to, um, it's definitely been Jacinda Ardern, um, watching the combination of humanity, humility, uh, expertise, acting fast, acting, um, you know, in, in a a pandemic is an emergency situation it's a slightly different style of leadership to um uh, a waiting and get, getting lots of views and seeing what emerges you know there was decisions that had to be made and so i like i like those moments because there are those moments right so the the one of my colleagues andy talks to me a lot about this idea of collaboration collaboration comes from we, we talk about it because we learn how the natural world collaborates right how um, the the nature collaborates and it and it uh, works in amazing ways that we should learn from and we should be more in root with but, and, and more connected to and more embodied with because if we were we would know how to live on this planet better and all of those sorts of things right but also the thing that nature also teaches you is about competition um, it, everything in nature doesn't just happen because everything works in a beautiful everyone like loves each other and just everything works there's lots and lots of moments in nature where competition does certain things and i ever since andy told me that i've thought about what that means in a healthy way right and when i look at some of the things um the commentary about jacinda i love the fact that there is her humanity her her motherhood her who she is as a feminist as a as a leader uh, plays out in every way uh, of of her leadership and how she talks and speaks and connects but there was moments that were really great right the moment of being able to act urgently and take the decision right and take a decision to go to the harshest lockdown me measures with perhaps the biggest effects on the economy and the biggest kind of sorry those things that we really wanted to do we are going to have to stop meant that in the long run you know they were that they're in a, in a really great place or a much better place 
there's something about that like taking a stand when you need to that really matters to me and i wonder sometimes in the collaboration com conversation collaboration is not just us all being nice together or to each other it's about it's all the complexities and messiness and being able to stop and say no right now the, the people who have the most information on this might be say the scientists or the doctors or whatever so actually i'm going to defer to you and add my bit onto it and so i think that there's something about that that i'm really interested in um and at a local level in birmingham we've had um you know loads of great um examples one particular one is is what i've seen happening in in the postcode of b16 it's been the it's been the home of the um the active well-being societies emergency food response etc but around there there's been not only emergency food response there's been uh connection amongst isolated neighbors there's been reimagination of spaces so loads of new growing spots and plots have have come together the community have been working together to uh do lots of great streetscape stuff and and showing some of that future uh in play so i really i, I think there's a lot to learn from um how the local community without resource um and without structures around it have been able to create um leadership on on a, a level that um is so inspiring and what what would that mean if that was designed for, if that was actually how we valued our communities and distributed resource and power and ownership and trust rather than it just being an emergency response. Um, and then my last example of like hope is um, the Black Lives Matter uprising um, really inspires me and is obviously also incredibly tough and sad and um, there's so much stuff within all of that but what really inspires me is over the I, I first saw Birmingham organizers rise up in 2016 um, when Sandra Bland was murdered and watching some of those young organizers now in 2020 they're building infrastructure they're building organizations they're building uh, pathways to see many of the ideas dreams things that they had imagined um, now coming in into into being that really in, inspires me that through such a difficult time in the middle of a pandemic with so where black and brown people are more disproportionately affected uh, we've then had all this trauma and and all of this brought back into the mainstream but within all of that our young leaders are still organizing they're still figuring out what the the next um radical stage of ideas of what we could be is possible and that that gives me a lot of inspiration so i am hopeful i think within the city um one of the things that is is um there's, there's also going to be a, a structural problem right like it, the, the work that i work in is about imagining futures and dreams and getting on with it at a level of a city there's so many different things that will hold certain things back and what i hope for is just real boldness on some of the things that we we saw so i know we're hearing a lot about active transport well-being etc but i'd really love to see some of the things that you know organizations overnight were able to do things that they previously talked about weren't being possible they were able to go digital they were able to center care they were able to understand for the first time we could see the interdependence of systems right be careful if you break your leg right now because you're going to end up in a hospital that's infected and you might go in with a broken leg but you could come out with something else this is a system at play right and we've been able to see it and we've been able to talk about it what i worry about is that um we won't quite be bold enough on some of the things that we need to we'll get dragged back into all the factors that um that we use as excuses right so we've we've been able to be flexible with parents and carers we've been able to work from home we've been able to be digital i'm not saying that we should never meet up or we should never do all those things but how do we take forward the things that all of a sudden were possible that will help access inclusivity help better workplaces that focus on well-being and collective care as we have done in this pandemic and as some of the great examples have shown in this pandemic how can that now become institutionalized so that that is how we are normally right it's not just an afterthought, childcare, care, uh, parents, women's role, equity. These are things that, you know, we can center care in our city in a different way. And I'm excited about that, but I, I think that needs a lot of work and I'm not hopeful that it will just happen overnight because there's quite a, a big pull to snap back 
to just getting the economy going, which means sometimes we have to sacrifice that, that nice stuff. Right, a, a lot of good things in there. I'm gonna come back to a number of them. There's your, your boldness point, I might add innovation to that. Uh, we'll come back to community empowerment, we'll come back to Black Lives Matters and, and all that's flowed from George Floyd, etc. Let me just go back even further to a word that uh, Louise first used, which was optimism. Uh, Yotunde, as, as a leader and to other leaders you look to, how much uh, is it the role of a leader to be optimistic, to be hopeful, a word that uh, him has used several times, how much responsibility or is it on them to be forward looking and to have that in a very uh, positive and optimistic light and how, how look on the flip side, where do they need to be responsible, where do they need to sort of look at the, at the actual events in front of them and the evidence in front of them and they need to be realistic. That's, that seems to me during this crisis to have been a difficult balancing act for all kinds of leaders, not just in the political sphere but in, and in business as well. How do you find that balance between optimism and reality? Yeah, thanks, Kevin. I, I think it's about honesty, to, to be honest. Um, my natural style is um, that I'm a, a natural optimist. So I find the optimism part quite easy because I look at a situation and I always try to find some positive in it. Um, and, and so I think people, my team will certainly say that if I'm, if I'm having a bad day, then it must be bad. It's that, that kind of thing. And I think if you're not optimistic as a leader, if you can't see the positives, even if it's just a glimmer, then you will have a problem leading people. Because if you are a naturally pessimist, what do people have to hold on to? So, for example, the conversation about furlough, are you able to have a con an honest conversation about it in terms of we're doing this to save your job you know um if somebody's saying okay am i going to be redundant my my first answer is we're doing this to save your job um and you are, you continue to be a part of the team and i've continued to engage those people who have been on furlough rather than just in a way leave them um thinking about all the different questions running around in their minds which may not be um may not have the correct answers to them so i think i think it is very important but again it's about that honesty and i think i would rather if i don't have the answer to a question i would rather be honest and say that i don't know rather than make up something just to make somebody feel good um so i it, and again it comes back to that authenticity um so it's about being um, very real as opposed to just being optimistic for, for, for the sake of it. But obviously you need positive people around you to be able to, um, to feed off. Um, and that's, again, where it comes back to that collaboration uh, and talking to people. I think Louise put something very useful in the, in the, in the chat. Um, and I've certainly spoken to Louise about this. Leadership can be a very, very lonely place. So people will look to their leader but not necessarily think that the leader needs um fulfilling as well so people won't won't tend to ask a leader are you okay because of course you're okay you're the leader we look to you you're supposed to be strong um and so i've realized that i do need that and and there are other places that i can get that from so again it comes back to louise and the illumini at common purpose um, other other people in senior leadership roles in um, other firms they will nourish you or they will nourish me uh, and enable me to continue being sort of as positive as I can be because when you you know when you look at this situation if anybody had said last year that this situation is going to happen one we would have said absolutely not but two when you when like Amy said this happened almost like a light switch it was a flick of a button but we we've all to a degree adapted yes it's a really very very difficult time and you know i've had members of my team that have been affected in the worst possible ways and it's about that you know collaboration to keep those people held up coping supportive uh, and, and everything else right thank you Zunday. Let, let's hope you remain positive throughout the rest of this session otherwise we really are in trouble <laughs> um uh, let me just remind people watching in that uh, do get your questions in use the chat facility uh, go on to twitter where uh, the hashtag is bham recovery bham recovery hashtag on twitter 
Uh, and uh, in a few minutes' time, Chris will curate some of those questions for us and we'll try and work our way through them. Uh, now, Louise, not at all prompted by you before we came on air, as it were. I'm going to pick up on one of the early points in, in Amy's last session when she referred to the New Zealand Prime Minister. She might have also referenced um, the, the German Chancellor mm -hmm. and their uh, ability to lead and to give clear communications through this uh, crisis. Uh, the New Zealand Prime Minister answering the question about whether the Easter Bunny would be able to come or not. It will go down as a classic. If you've not seen it online, do look it up. Um, Louise, do have, during this crisis, and I don't just mean in political terms, during this crisis, have we seen that uh, females are better at leading? Sorry, you broke up for a second there, Kevin. Have you seen the... Have you seen that females uh, have, been, uh, have made for better leaders than males? Go, oh, talk, talk about a loaded question. Um, <laughs> I've seen some fantastic examples actually of male and female leaders, but I think the one thing that I think the good examples of leadership I've seen have been more about that empathy, compassion, checking in with people. I think, um, you know, I think there's this fallacy that. Um, that leaders are heroic, charismatic people, and that that's our kind of traditional view of leadership. And I, I think that's long gone. But I think that I think the challenge that we have sometimes when we talk about leadership is there are lots of fantastic leaders who are much more who are much quieter, much more reflective. They don't come in and save the day, but but they just are great leaders, and they're enabling other leaders. And and actually, they don't need the limelight. They don't want the limelight. That's not so. So I think. I think I've seen both. I think um, I think some people that have come from a traditional command and control type of organisation where you know they they make the decisions. And I, I think Emmy's point about being decisive is really interesting. It's really important. But I think some people have really struggled to get the supportive, empathetic side of things right. And some have openly come to me and kind of gone, "This is a whole new world for me." And I know I've got to do it, but it feels uncomfortable. But again, I think that's a real positive because at least they're reflecting on that. So, so I, I, I don't think it's about male or female leaders. I think it's about the one thing I love when I talk to people is about thinking about people as individuals. So, so trying to kind of get, get past the labels. And, and I think the really, one of the really interesting reflections I have is, is those of us that really like being out and about and get our energy from people, actually in some ways, this whole new world of virtual leadership feels harder, I think, for us than some people who are typically quieter. And, and that's the sweeping generalization, but I've had that conversation with a few people. So I, I, I don't think you can make sweeping generalizations like that because there are some female leaders who have kind of almost grown up in that image of I'm going to be... I'm going to follow what has been in the past seen as traditional male leadership traits and be, you know, um, whatever that means to them. So I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to give you a bit of a nuanced answer to that. I, I think some people have been better at the kind of support and empathy, but I think that has to come to the fore now. I think for all leaders, I think we've all got to be better at that, dealing with things like mental health, supporting our people. I think we've had windows into people's worlds that we might never have had before. And I think we can't go back from that. You can't just go back to, to normal, whatever new normal is, and pretend that you don't know that other people have things that are important to them in their lives. So I think it's, in some ways it's broken down barriers and in some ways it's reinforced that this has never been a level playing field for any of us because some of us are working at home and we have space and gardens and you know we've got someone in our team who's flat sharing and working off a laptop on a settee it's just not sustainable so um sorry long answer to a difficult question but basically a no nuance but fundamentally fundamentally not. Let, i, I want to come back to one or two of the things that in particular any but all of you have raised to go around community empowerment and, and events uh, in the states that have, have led over here uh, in a minute let me just do one or two other sort of business and, and sort of economic uh, questions if I can frame it in that way. Amy, can could you just address in, in terms of what we now need from leaders? W one of the great strengths of Birmingham in the wider area, of course, is its its diversity and its youth, which is sort of ran down in all the sort of marketing messages we, we hear about uh, Birmingham these days and, and wider Westmorlands. Uh, 
And of course, it will be young people who may be greatly affected by this crisis, particularly in terms of employment or opportunities for employment. Uh, and as you touched on, I think, uh, a number of diverse communities have been more harshly affected by COVID uh, than the wider population and kinds of discussions and debates about that. So what, what do we need, need to do now to address those two sort of strands of our community in and around Birmingham, which are our great strengths and which add to our values, but who, of course, may be uh, some of the most greatly affected by the crisis. What kind of leadership do we need to address that? Um, okay, so so massive question, because, uh, like, I could, I could do an hour on the sort of structural change we need it for to combat sort of systemic racism and uh, inequality in our society. Um, there's, there's some things that I can go to early on, um, which is uh, distributed ownership. We need more um, spaces, assets um, that those communities can own, can organize, can not be um, just in, in the, 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 the kind of um, relationship where you're renting or um having to never be, be never being able to build your own strength um in that space and i've seen that a lot with how local communities um have been using you know empty shop fronts and all sorts to just organize in a in a um in an emergency food response or um or whatever they've been doing so there's there's a whole bunch of stuff there there's lots and lots of great work happening in this space right i could I could list off like 50 organizations for you now, leaders, black and brown, young, uh, doing uh, really important um, work. And what I would say is center them, as opposed to trying to think about from like a, a space of the city, like how do we like encapsulate this into a big, um, you know, um, uh, all encompassing message bring those leaders to the table, resource them, centre them, listen to them, the answers are all there. I think that it links back to the question that you said about, you know, um, male or female, who's a, who's a better leader. I think that what we've seen over the last um, few months is leader, we, we've all, like, you know, the work that I do has always talked about this, but collective leadership is where we should be. Um, the reason why we can't be is because governance structures need a head on the table. They need a spokesperson. They need to know who's the person that goes down if this goes wrong. Who's the person that I hold accountable if this goes wrong? Uh, and why I link this to the sort of male and female um, uh, question that you asked is because I think for those of you who might be interested, and, and she's back much more in the public eye at the moment, she tends to, to quietly write and, and not, not do so many talks, but Angela Davis talks about this really well around um, leadership being beyond the gender binary. Um, it's actually a set of feminist principles, collective leadership principles that we need to centre more. The more we centre this, is it male or female, um, it takes us into all sorts of directions that don't make sense. Um, and yes, there is definitely a pushback against hyper-masculine types of leadership, right? Which have been that, that centre the single leader the know, the know it, the know everything, the kind of, there has to be a head on the table, that aggressive, I know the answers, I, I'm like that, that hyper masculine trait that has taken us in a, in a, in a direction that most would agree is, is not a good one, is not as simple as male or female, right? So it speaks to what Louise talked about around those same traits can become in, in, in women as well right so the point is to try and move beyond that look at what the leadership of the future needs we shouldn't be having individual heads on tables because organizations missions work is never individuals it's collective people great recoveries great responses from the community have been collective it's the, it's a society we're in that needs a spokesperson or needs me to be the one out of the eight people that does the work in my organization every day um, to be the sort of leader so I think there's a paradigm shift there. Um, but going back to your point about what we've seen in the disproportionate effects, there is a big piece of work that is a, that is a generation of work around systemic um, uh, institutional racism. But what we need to do is center the people doing the work, right? Like they have to be centered. We have to stop doing inquiries 
where we get consultants to listen to a bunch of people say a bunch of recommendations that then get kicked into the long grass we need to invest in the leaders that we have today invest in their in their growth whatever that looks like in their ability to access resource assets ownership land housing community housing all these different things the ideas are there it's it just needs to be more distributed and more decentralized in my opinion thank you Amy. i'm going to come back to some of those points i just want to make sure we we capture from a business perspective i'm going to come to you yatunde uh we've heard of the, the the traits and the kind of examples of good leadership during this crisis you've touched on them yourself uh, what are we going to remember? What, what are we going to forget about changes in leadership? But how much are we going to go back to the old normal? Uh, or how much are we going to learn from this experience? And in particular, I think referenced about uh, companies and organisations perhaps embracing digital like they couldn't quite before, didn't quite get themselves to, and here we are all living our lives on Zoom or Teams or, or whatever. Uh, and also, I suppose you, you might reference the issue of homelessness, which is close to I know, your heart and many of us, uh, which uh, never had a solution. But all of a sudden, at this crisis, some at least temporary solutions were found all of a sudden out of the blue. What are we going to learn uh, and do something with? What are we going to forget in terms of uh, what good leadership looks like? It, that's a really interesting question. I think... Um you know, I, I'm as guilty as the next person. Um, we introduced agile working um, and we were doing pretty well with it. So everybody could agile work at least one time, well, once a week. Um, and I had a particular issue about support staff. How can support staff do their role from home? But actually this has shown me that they, 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 they definitely can. Um, and so I think also the pandemic has resulted in, I think Louise touched upon this, it's almost a flip. Um, a, a reverse so at work physically being in work it's all about the work and family becomes a secondary point I think the pandemic has made it almost the family and home life and what people are experiencing has become um, a, a primary um, thing and the work to a degree has become a secondary point in terms of what we're checking is that people are okay that the coping in terms of the mental health the people who have got the challenges of homeschooling We've certainly done a staff survey, and I think the, st the staff survey, the results have been really that people want that flexibility. And I, you know, I still hear people talking about distrust of colleagues in terms of whether they're going to do the work from home in the future, in, in terms of actually being productive. Um, but I think we've shown that that really shouldn't be an issue. People can be performance managed if you, know, if you, if you la lay the groundwork so I think, um, I think what we will take away from it is this flexibility. And I certainly think that people work better and are more effective if they can be flexible. Um, so since the last session, for example, I've worked a nine day fortnight. I don't think any of my colleagues or any of my clients would even know that every other Monday I'm not in the office. Um, that flexibility allows me to work more effectively to give, to give more um, turning to your point about homelessness, you know, what happened was nothing short of a miracle, to be honest, um, in terms of that collective response. And certainly I worked with some of my um, registered provider clients um, working again in collaboration with the local authorities um, to use um, accommodation um, that, that was currently available to provide accommodation to um, people who at the time were homeless. But again, homelessness is a, a complex issue um, because uh, one of my clients specifically said, despite the fact that we provided the accommodation, people are preferring to leave it and, and go onto the streets. But it's de definitely shown that what can be done. And um, so that going forward will be really interesting to see what we're able to achieve going forward. Because in reality, there should be no reason why we have to go back to people. Um, being without accommodation if they if they want it and there are a small minority that you know that prefer to live on the streets but in the main people obviously don't um, and so it, you know it will be as I've said interesting to see what happens going forward but again it comes down to funding and it's clear that there's been bags and bags of money available in certain places and it and, and it can be made available so we should be demanding that that's you know that's the situation going forward. Thank you very much. 
Uh, Louis, I'm going to turn to you. I think you're trying to use the word productivity in, in the sort of first half of our answer. How do you lead? How have you seen? How do you lead when people are not in an office around you? You're not bumping into them at their desks or the water cooler or, or wherever. You're not having constant meetings with them, formal or formal. How do, how do you lead well when your workforce is agile, to use that, that term, their homeworking, whatever, and particularly if we're going to do which seems likely we're going to do a touch more agile and homeworking than, than we did uh, before this crisis starts. How, how do you maintain and indeed improve productivity? How do you lead uh, when you can't sort of see and touch uh, yeah. the people who are working for you? I, I mean, I think you turns I touched on it um, earlier in, in terms of that communication <laughs> is incredibly important and that kind of checking in. But again, I think, you know, I'd reflect on the fact that we kind of probably went a bit overboard at the beginning and we were checking in with people all the time and having, you know, meetings every day. And it was kind of just overwhelming. And we hadn't figured out, I'm sure lots of people have, have figured this out now, how exhausting it was just doing back to back, you know, team meetings or Skype meetings or Zoom meetings. So I think I think what we've got to think about is this is um this has been like, you know, a crisis like no other crisis. And I used to work in crisis comms and before you'd have a crisis and you kind of, you know, it could rumble on for a long time, but there would be an immediate sort of crisis response and you'd have that adrenaline rush and the team would get together and then you just go back to business as normal. This is something completely different that none of us have faced before. And I think the challenges, I think, you know, clarity of communication, checking in with people is really important. But asking people what they need is really important and listening because we don't all want to be checked in with every day and it becomes a bit overwhelming. I think the other thing that I've reflected on is we've kind of almost, I think some of us have gone kind of too far that way. So we're having all these kind of, you know, Zoom socials with people we wouldn't have socialized before from across, you know, our international organization. And I'm kind of like, I'm not being funny, but it's not that I don't want to see them, but I don't want to do this every week. It feels... So I think it's, it feels like a pendulum to me that's kind of, we've realized we need to communicate, we need to support people, we've gone that way, we now need to come back. And I think the real challenge is going to be, I think it's really interesting, you turned those point about trust. I think kind of really we've adapted relatively easily. I think there's two things. We've, we've stopped doing some stuff. And my question now is, did any of that add value? Do we need to bring it back or should we just leave it? So I think we have to build in time to reflect. Um, I think we need to ask people what they need from us as managers and leaders so it isn't just top down again. And I think the other thing that I'm finding a real challenge, and I don't know what the answer is to this, so again, it's, it's kind of I'm curious to see what other people are doing. The bits that I feel we're missing are those social interactions or the, the stuff that you learn when you're in the office with other people and you go, can I just ask you what you think about this? Or the stuff that someone hears when you're having a phone call and the informal learning or the, oh, Louise, you've just spoken to that person, I forgot to tell you this is happening. There's all of that sort of stuff that isn't a formal part of a day that happens in teams and with people, whether it's people you meet and have coffee with, that I'm thinking, how on earth do we rec recreate that so we don't lose it? Because we've done very well, I think, recreating the we can do this formal thing, we can do a meeting, we've got fantastic use of technology, but I, I still think we're missing something. And I think the other really important thing is how do we create a sense of belonging to something if we're not physically together? Because to me personally, and I, I don't know about anybody else, I don't get a sense of belonging from Zoom chats. And, and maybe that's just me and I need to get over it, but there will come a time when I just want to sort of be in the same place as people I care about and want to work with and collaborate with. Yeah. Well, hopefully you're feeling a degree of connection with your with your fellow panelists and with our with yes, our audience. Of course. Sorry, yes, I should have said it's lovely, but I will <laughs> I will welcome the day when I can, you know, go to home deli and have a coffee and connect with people face to face. There's something about the energy of being around people for me personally that I miss. Yes, indeed, and hopefully it won't be too long before we're back in that world, even if we're carrying on with some elements of what we've learned and experienced in the last uh, 13 weeks. We're coming to the time uh, midday where we said we'd sort of slightly wrap up the panel discussion to a degree and, and throw it open to our audience. 
Uh, and so I'm going to do that. We've got, we're beginning to have uh, one or two questions in. I'm going to take the, the first question that we've had in from Rebecca uh, <clears throat> in a second, but also I, I, just to say that I will do want to come back to some of the points that have been uh, addressed either head on or uh, in passing uh, during the course of the last hour, not least, uh, of course, um, events of the last two or three weeks uh, that, that effectively triggered in America, but of course have got wider consequences and we're all uh, want to draw on uh, and comment on when it comes to um, what we need from leaders. Uh, but let me just take this first question first and please do, to our audience, do use the Q&A function. I think Chris at, uh, at the Cornwall Bid will be also checking in on uh, Twitter, so if you look at your comments and questions there, hashtag BHAM recovery. Uh, so do use that as well. So uh, throw your questions in. I'm going to try and turn as much of the next half an hour over to, to you, the audience, rather than me asking the questions. But on behalf of um, Rebecca, I'll come to you first on this, Imi. On behalf of Rebecca Manda, she says, we talk about leaders supporting their teams. Who is supporting the leaders? We touched on that a little bit, you turned in passing. Uh, as Louise has said, it is a lonely place. Uh, leaders are listening so well right now, and that takes its toll. How can we encourage leaders to su seek support themselves? So, uh, Amy, could you start us off on that? I, I mean, yes. Um, so I, I, I can see both sides of this. I find both doing the work that I do and the responsibility that you end up having as a result of the things I mentioned earlier. Um, yeah, I do find it lonely. It's in, incredibly difficult. There's there's all sorts of stuff that flies at you all day, every day, all times of, of the of the night, for years and years and years. And and because of the way that I, the work that we do, that comes not just within the organisation. It comes from everywhere, right? And I think that there, there's no doubt. And I I don't think I've been um, like not public about it. That I you know. I find I find some of it just absolutely so difficult to deal with um, and and so so there, there's that part of it that the loneliness is difficult right at the same time I think um, I'm really lucky to be within a team where um, in our day-to-day -day we really try to foster that collective care um, that um, support that collective leadership the world forces Emmy to come out and talk because it's the person that that is often the one who's asked and and those sorts of things but on a day-to-day -day we have a culture where we do really centre care and we're, we're trying to figure out how to do that more and more for, for different reasons that I can maybe talk about later when I, when I wrap up um, but I think that on a structural level absolutely I, I think that you know we should the National Health Service should have therapy for everyone right like I do genuinely believe in the fact that there needs to be specific support, culturally specific support, sector specific support. Um, I seek it out when I need it. I have bad moments, I'm open with those. Um, but it's an ongoing question, right? But the ongoing question is about, for me, at a structural level is, this pandemic has forced us to think about how we care with, for each other in different ways. That comes back to my point of the fact that the way we organise society means that we need to put one or two people at the top of things so we can blame them when things go wrong, which then also means that those people have an unnecessary burden that they shouldn't necessarily have by themselves. That should be more collective. And so, yes, let's get some, some more support to, to leaders. We can do that through lots and lots of different ways. Incredible therapists I know who supports lots of people that, that I've worked with in Birmingham called Wanjiku. Uh, Niache. She's amazing and she does a lot of this coaching and support but if we're going to talk about this really properly I am not just interested in how we keep supporting leaders in their lonely endeavour as they tackle the stuff that they're doing right because they shouldn't be on their own. Things should be more collective. Accountability and um, governance should should start to move towards more collective accountability and we should be fostering care at the center of society which would mean that we'd have less of this so i care about it on a practical level but on a societal level i think it's about a shift that we need to have in our generation that stops it being so lonely and stops us being how do we support these people that are doing such a hard job by themselves or you know taking on so much responsibility by themselves and I know there's lots of technicalities in the audience. People will say, but you have boards and you have senior directors and you have, 
yeah, I, I know all of, I, I totally understand that. But I know that at the end of the day, we put two, we build people up to then put them in a place where we can tear them down if something goes wrong. And at the core of it, that's a challenge. But yeah, we need, we need to collectively support each other in so many ways. I feel very supported, but I know there's more that we, we need to do. Right. Uh, you, you attend a first then, Louise. Anything you want to add to that? I think Amy's covered that very well, but anything you want to add, you attend a no. <laughs> you talked about your board earlier, didn't you? And I was the board yeah, and um, so, so uh, you know, at the end of the day, I've got a, a national board um, that I can go to, and then I've got my fellow partners um, in Birmingham. I, I think family, and, and that's your own personal support network. Um, I certainly am very, very lucky uh, in that my husband is not in the profession. My husband's a barber, um, but, you know, he is very, very supportive. Um, and again, I've got friends in the position, uh, in the profession as well that I can, uh, I can turn to. But I think it is really, really important to have that outlook. Um, and I, I certainly had a very long conversation with Louise about, you know, wow, I'm head of office and it feels as though... Um, not that nobody cares, but it's almost as though just people don't give you that feedback. And I've been quite aware of that. And so I've been giving regular feedback to, for example, my senior partner in terms of, yeah, your communications on point or have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? Because it's not right that it's a lonely point. And I do take Amy's point about sometimes it feels as though, you know we have leaders so that we can be extremely critical of them if things don't go right um and people rarely give you praise so I, you know i've been told as i said this is my first six months in my role and i've said to one of my colleagues how am i doing well if nobody said anything to you you're doing okay but is that really good enough I didn't feel it was, you know, it, it would have been nice to have some feedback because I, I see that, you know, if nobody's told you, not told you that you're doing it wrong, you're doing okay, it's just, you know, that, that's one for the history books, really. It should be more than that. So I'd encourage everyone to give their leaders feedback. Okay, Louise, anything else to, to add again? I think you've, you've touched on a number of things that are on this issue, haven't you, supporting leaders? Yeah, I think, I think a couple of things. I think don't be afraid to ask for help. Um, you know, I have people that I can go to and kind of go, is it just me? Because sometimes when you're, you know, tired and you've got a lot on your plate, you can quite naturally sometimes overreact to things. And sometimes it's just good to sense check it with someone. Um, and I think, you know, that generally takes, you know, people that you trust their opinion and they can be critical friends to you and they can actually say, yeah, do you know what? You must be having a bad day because there was nothing going on there or they could say actually yeah you know um i think it doesn't always have to be people that you know really well i've been really surprised with this that some people that i don't know particularly well i've just reached out to and gone frikey i can see your organization's going through some really tough stuff how are you doing and people have come back and gone yeah could we have a call because actually nobody's asked me how i'm doing so i i think you know there's a responsibility on all of us if we care about our places and our cities to just reach out and be there for people if we you know, and I've done the same when I've seen people having a hard time on Twitter, which can be a very um, challenging place sometimes. And I've just sort of sent people a direct message going, are you OK? Because, you know, this is this seems like a tough conversation. I'm here if you want to have a chat. And then I think the other thing is one of the things that, you know, when students come to talk to people on our programs, I've always encouraged our leaders to be really honest about the fact that, you know, it can be hard and you don't have all the answers. And then, you know, younger emerging leaders and students are kind of going, oh, crikey, yeah, I see now. Because I think it's very easy for us to stand there and go, why don't they, whoever they is, just do this? The reality is, is until we get behind the complexity of a particular situation, we never understand the challenges, the constraints of the system, you know, the, the lack of result, whatever the issues are, we never understand that. So I kind of, I kind of, being kind to people and and understanding that you don't understand the complexity before you kind of so I think about being a good follower as well which is that kind of recognizing it might be tough for other people and kind of going you know are you okay can I can I help 
Okay, thank you, Louise. Thank you, all of you, for your answers on, on that. Uh, let me go to our next uh, question. You, you're talking there, Louise, about uh, Twitter. Here's a man up and down to take to Twitter. Uh, a director of the Cornwall bid, Mike Best. He says, in a, not, a, not at all uh, looking to set up a good discussion at, at here, Mike. Mike Best says, anyone care to comment on the apparent divide between the efforts business, local government, and third sector have been making in recent years to demonstrate more compassionate leadership and the failure of politicians on the national stage to do so. Uh, so the difference there between uh, others, including businesses and local government, uh, community organisations, charities, and national leaders, in terms of uh, the failure to uh, be more compassionate and show that form of leadership uh, on the national stage. Amy, I, I feel as if I want to come to you first. Look, like I, I can comment on it. I mean, I'm very open about it. I'm not, I'm not surprised by it, right? Because the the lack of compassion has been institutional and structural over the last uh, ten years. But I can use some high profile um, examples. Um, we can talk about the Windrush scandal. We can talk about Grenfell. We can talk about so many moments um, in. What happened with with the, the the sort of Brexit vote, where that lack of compassion has been core institutionally, um, shown out and played out in lots of ways. So for me, I'm not surprised that we are where we are. I, I could have I could have told I could have talked about this. You know, if we have a pandemic, um, this is what's going to happen. We literally unwound the support systems that we had in this country for those things happening because we didn't think they were important because we were on a different mission. So, you know, I, I, that's all I'm going to say on it because I'm not surprised. This hasn't come out of the blue. I'm not, um, I'm not going to get into a Twitter war as to whether the other side has done a good enough job to tell a different story or whatever. We are where we are. We voted for it. We knew what was coming. And lots and lots of communities already knew this was going to happen from, from um, how we dealt with other, other catastrophes and other trauma like Grenfell, like Windrush, like deportation so for me um yeah of course this is just another another peg and this one has some serious consequences so i hope that we you know really engage in a conversation about what we want for the future um and when we vote and what sort of political future we want and what actual consequences that can have um on the flip side i think you know that that gives a space for all the sectors that mike has talked about um coming together in different ways, right? And figuring out new normals. And sometimes you have to be right in the trenches to understand what it means to not take that stuff seriously, to not take it seriously about, you know, what kind of society we want to have, what kind of society we want to build, what kind of leaders we want to be. And hopefully what it does is it brings forward the role of all of us as, as um, civic uh, actors, right? As a business, as an individual, as a resident, as third sector, we are all actors within this system as well. And perhaps when we have a government that isn't doing what it's doing right now, we can default a bit more to say, oh, that's not my problem. Whereas right now it is our problem. It's everybody's problem. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe I'll bring this up later if, if we have a chance. It also, what we're doing now collectively also needs us to reflect on what we actually think is coming next, right? Like we have enough information to know roughly what we think is coming next right so i'm interested in what this mobilization of all these sectors and the the shock of covid the impact of everything changing overnight like what will that mean in the sense of what do you genuinely think is coming in the next 10 to 15 years because that's where i think it the, what we do now out of this pandemic will be crucial um, and i understand why we've got to get the economy going on a number of different levels, theoretically, from an equality and equity level, uh, from a well-being level, but there's also some serious questions about what it is we're working towards. Um, so yeah, I think I think look, there's some great opportunities, but I'm not particularly surprised. And as a country, whatever we we voted this in, having seen the response to other tragedies, so we've got to suck it up and try and get on with the, how we work together to to vision out a future that is more just and equitable and isn't hit by multiple shocks, of which I think COVID is the first of many to come. Yeah, Tunda, can you pick up on compassion? Um, where have you seen com compassion through leaders at a local and national level, private, public, voluntary, 
sector. Um, and whereas it's difficult perhaps to be a national leader and, and for whatever any of us may think good or bad about people in national leadership positions, uh, probably a number of us wouldn't fancy being in those positions over the last uh, few weeks. How, how difficult, what kind of challenge do national leaders face to both show compassion, speak compassion, but also to be able to deliver it through, through actions? There's the question. Um, I'll, I'll take some small examples and I, I, one of the things that I do want to talk about is the Black Lives Matters and, and what's happened over the last um, couple of weeks, well not even a couple of weeks, so let's be honest, the last 400 plus years. Um, and you know, you know it, it's just been a very, very interesting time, as Amy said, on top of, on top of Covid um, and obviously the report that's come out that's basically said that you know um, black and Asian minority ethnic people are more susceptible to COVID and, and that and the evidence is certainly um, there. Um, following the death of George Floyd it, it's been really interesting I've been very 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 active on on LinkedIn um, and people know what the issue is the government knows what the issue is it's structural systemic racism um, but is it going to act? No, all we've had from Boris is, oh, yeah, I'm going to set up yet another commission. And I'm kind of at that stage of like, what do you not understand about this? You know, we've had that many reports, we've had that many uh, commissions, we've had that many disasters, tragedies. What do we, what, what is it that we need to do? So to me, that compassion is not turning into action, not quick enough, because it's only action that's going to resolve this. Um, and, and so you know, that's my big thing at the moment is that we need to see the action. If we see the action, then it drips down to everything. All the things that Imi's touched upon, the disadvantage, the accommodation, um, the diet, the, everything. But it's got to come from the people who control the money to a degree or we as a community have got to do it ourselves. Um, and Birmingham is a great mixture of different richness of cultures and I, I am really looking to the Birmingham community to really start taking some solid action rather than well what is it that we need to do we all know what is right we all know what is wrong you know even if I just I can't even go there in relation to the you know the racial pay gap tell me about that I, you know I'd love to speak to somebody who sets the pay structures in their firm that knows that they've got a racial pay gap tell me why does it exist Give me an explanation um, and and so it involves some really difficult conversations i'm not relying on our current government um, to unpick this there's a lot to unpick but it, i i think the difference with this is that it's got to come from the bottom up and we as a nation of people have got to demand better and actually do better because we can all resolve this in our in our own lives by you know, calling out the bias, calling out the inappropriate behaviour. We've all seen it, we've witnessed it, and we've all stood by and done nothing about it. But that's where I'll stop. Well, uh, okay, it. stop there for a second. I'm going to stay with you, you Tom Death, I might. What, what do you want from leaders uh, locally? Yeah, and what do you want from local business leaders, from local government leaders, regional leaders, from uh, the community sector, the voluntary sector that we've heard a lot about? What, what in practical terms, can we do to uh, uh, both address the sort of fundamental challenges that, that you've all spoken about, but also to try and shift the government from a perhaps from another review to actually implementing many of the actions which are still sitting in uh, re as recommendations in many of the previous reviews. Yeah, I, I think it's that you know we can start with the conversation, and I think it's but it's a different type of conversation. For me, it's the um, the conversations that I've been having are the conversations where in the past I've tried to present my information in a way that would be acceptable to the people that I'm delivering the message to rightly or wrongly but now I've sort of said do you know what I'm, I'm not going there anymore so I will call it out so let's have an honest conversation about it um, where you know I had a conversation with this one of my senior partners and I said this is not going to be pretty I've not rehearsed it you know I'm really sorry if it offends you but I need to be honest so in a way I guess it's for us to really look at what are we doing around um, the diversity inclusion 
making sure that all of our people feel that sense of belonging, looking at our boardrooms, are they reflective of the wider community or are they not? If not, what can we do? Look at our recruitment policies. So it's that, it, it's that commitment to do something. It is what I'm asking for from, from the Birmingham community because this issue is so big and this is where I've agonised with it and been, you know, I want to change the world. I realise I can't do that. So I have to start with what I have control over and what I have or influence over. Not that I have control, I have influence. So in those conversations that I'm having with people now, I'm going to ask them the difficult questions. And even if it's a case of just that they take something to wait and think about it, then I'm happy that, that at least they're thinking about it. Yeah, Louise, can I sort of follow that through with you and say that the kind of things that Utende was uh, touching on there, for example, including recruitment and uh, the sort of shape and face of boardrooms, uh, uh, people like you and me and others have spoken about those things over many years. Yeah. What's different now? What's different from George Floyd onwards from the events that we've seen in and around uh, some of the cities in this country? Uh, what's different now that gives us hope that we can make a, a bigger change than? the journey we've been on so far? Um, I think that's a really good question and it's probably something that a lot of people are, are grappling with and, and I, I think the, the response of young people has been really impressive in terms of young people. I was talking to a colleague and she said my daughter's never got involved in anything before like this and she's signing petitions and she's going out and she wants to make a difference. She wants to she wants her voice to be heard um, and I, I think there is a moment in time um, where it's become even more apparent if it wasn't apparent to you before it's apparent now that something has to change and I think it's a time for people to listen and to hear other people's stories and then to kind of take action and I suppose it's it's about understanding what are other people that are doing that's making a difference and working um because i think we we will have i think the next generation of leaders coming through and the younger generation aren't going to settle for nothing happening i think they're going to drive help drive the change which i think is is important but i think we will have failed you know if if you think of yourself as a middle leader or a senior leader or whatever you think of yourself i think the responsibility is on us as leaders to help make that change happen and to just you know to kind of ask the questions and I think the power of a good question is really important and it doesn't always have to be in a I'm going to call you out on Twitter and shame you into making a difference and then you're going to come back with a knee-jerk reaction that's not what I'm talking about I'm talking about that kind of the question that really makes people stop and think and reflect and think about their organization but then do something different about it and I think the other thing that I would encourage people to do is I think there's a tendency for us, us, and I mean us, as in, you know, um, sometimes the business community, the white business community, if, if I can label myself even on in that way, even though I'm a social business, to think, well, we can engage schools by getting schools to come in. But actually, I've known some fantastic schools that have said, actually, no, I need you, the business professionals, a different order, to come out to the school because this is not accessible to our young people even walking into Colmore Row into a, an office. And actually, I think when you start to think about things from other people's perspectives and ask them the question and find out what they need and how they think change is gonna happen, it will be much more meaningful and long-term and sustainable rather than us sitting in a, in whatever our little bubble is, our silo, and thinking that we have the answers. I think it's time for us to listen. Right. Uh, Amy, can I ask you, perhaps put it in, in these terms, perverse as it may seem for all that's gone on particularly in terms of covid and more recently in terms of events in minnesota and then here uh, does it actually give you a sense because of the what uh, louise has said and yatunde has been uh, saying on chat uh, because of young people because of the strength of their feeling and their passion and their activism and perhaps added to that the sort of technological capabilities that we've got through social and digital media does it give you hope that we can make a more of a difference, be better at this, we can encourage our leaders to make the right kind of actions when it comes to addressing uh, racial prejudice and the barriers that prevent people from uh, black and minority ethnic communities uh, making it in life and employment and in, and in other terms. Are you 
in a sense, more hopeful because of what has gone on. Absolutely. Um, what I'm worried about, though, I'm, I'm, I'm eternally hopeful. Um, I, was, I was on a, a Sunday school session listening to Angela Davis the other day and somebody asked her whether she thought this was a seminal moment. And she said, no, this is a germinal moment. This is the moment where the seeds have been planted in lots of different ways for a completely different future. Oh, absolutely. Now, the thing is, the thing that I would say, having um, watched so many movements and knowing some of the leaders behind some of the roads must fall in Oxford and the Colston movement in Bristol, is that it depends whether it's going to happen to this region or whether this region is going to step forward, right? Um, Twitter and what's happening in the way that people are being called out is, is the result of many, many decades of not finding safe spaces to be able to do that, to see change happening at a level, you know, you get more black and brown faces on boards, but actually often you're sat there just confirming decisions that have already been made and making sure that the, you know, the pictures of the board, you know, look great. You know, th these, are, these are things that actually either they're going to happen to this region or we're going to step up and we're going to confront it, right? So I would love, I'd love to see Birmingham go on the front foot because there is a deep, deep colonial legacy here, riding through so many things around how things are owned, around what, what assets uh, have happened, how we gained our wealth. And, you know, and what we don't want is that the, the, what happened with Colston wasn't a sudden random moment where they pulled down that statue. That movement to have stuff change in Bristol has been going on for for years. The same has been with the Roads Must Fall movement. There is plenty of that also happening in Birmingham. What I urge the city to do is step forward, not wait and go, ah, oh, like we were okay. We didn't, they didn't quite come for us and we survived that round because the more you keep doing that, the more you are just delaying what is coming is coming anyway. And that's all of us, right? Like I, I, I've been um, called out on plenty of stuff um, from fellow uh, uh, black organisers uh, from uh, black organisers who I've worked with and other things where I've had to be uncomfortable about learning what that means. Everyone's got to get ready to get a bit uncomfortable. And I think that if we can do this in a way that is like everyone confronts and put their, their best foot forward rather than just waiting and waiting and waiting to be shamed or waiting for a protest or waiting for it to happen on Twitter or waiting for your organisation to, to get found out in an article or something like that, the more you can confront that and, and go, right, okay, how do I actively step into this and how do I own it? It doesn't mean you have to be apologetic for, for everything that ever happened on your head, but you've got to take some responsibility about, you know, what the role of Birmingham. If we can do that, I think we can do it in a way that is both radical, transformative, that centres like a better future rather than the fight between us all. Um, am I hopeful of that? Probably not, because I've only seen that that sort of stuff happens when we get to breaking point and then everybody changes because they have to. Um, but yeah, I'd finish on saying centre black voices, take your best foot forward. The struggle isn't just the last few weeks, it will continue. And the more you can step into it, the more you can deal with your discomfort and the more we can speak to the, the injustices that have happened and then the actions that lead what happens after that the more we can do this in a proactive way rather than just waiting for the next round where it gets really scary for everyone and um and that's and, and nobody actually deeply wants that they just want justice and equity and peace and to thrive and to be able to live um good lives so yeah i'd say step forward okay thank you uh we're in our uh last four or five minutes so i'm going to try and draw us to a bit of a conclusion i'm going to go around the panel uh, and um, particularly picking up Nintendo's point earlier, we're going to be positive, we're going to be optimistic uh, in our closing remarks. Uh, and if I can ask you to sort of thread your closing remarks panel around this sort of call cool question, uh, what is it in the way that we've seen leadership in and around Birmingham to date through this crisis and before? What is it that gives you hope that Birmingham and the Greater Birmingham area and the West Midlands are going to come out of this uh, awful pandemic uh, into good things, good things in terms of our economy, good things in terms of our society. What have we got that we're going to build on in leadership terms? So if you could sort of frame your closing minute around that uh, slightly woolly question. Uh, Louise, I'd be grateful if you would kick us off. Yeah, okay, so I, I've done a couple of sessions recently, one with the head of public health 
in Birmingham City Council and one with the Chief Executive of St Basil's, which lots of you will know is an organisation that support young people who are homeless or at risk of being homeless. And, and um, Jean from St Basil's works right across the region on supporting the um, focus on reducing homelessness. And you know what, I've been really, really impressed with how positive and optimistic people have been to keep the best of what has happened in terms of collaboration and working together and making a difference in, in, in really, really difficult circumstances. So taking this burning platform and doing stuff we didn't know we could do as a city in a region and using that learning and energy to carry on making the city you know and the region a great place but also redressing that balance of sharing the opportunities more and creating more of a level playing field so so i don't get the sense from the people that i talk to that there's people sitting there not wanting that to happen for me there's an energy there and an excitement there around let this is this has been tough for lots of people in lots and lots of different ways let's work together and i think there's been a huge amount of optimism and positivity and I don't think it's been false optimism and positivity. I think it's been grounded in reality, which I think is really kind of adult. So, um, and I think, I think people will be more open to listening, which is a hugely important thing. They'll be more open to listening and reflecting and thinking, what can I do? What personal responsibility can I take on board as a leader? So I think it's a really exciting time for leadership. And I think you know, the responsibilities on us to make the most of it and to, um, you know, take, I mean, the, the, the city's motto is forward. And I think actually, if ever there was a time that we needed to remember that now is that time. So I'm feeling quite hopeful and positive about it. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and both the people you quote, Jean and uh, Justin, who I saw this morning on the a Chamber of Commerce event are both uh, fantastic examples of leaders and fantastic communicators as well to boot. Uh, Imi, what's your, what's, what gives you hope in terms of what we've got uh, to build on in leadership terms in Birmingham and the wider region? Um, yeah, I think the two things give me hope. I think from a, a business level, um, so much of the learnings of the last few months have opened up new possibilities for us. Um, I think, you know, leaving behind that that didn't serve us and thinking about what um, what we can keep, uh, how we can support each other more, how we can put that care and whole the whole of people's lives at the centre of our businesses, and and be able to understand how to make that work um, in is, is there right, and and that's the first step to to lots of things where we start to balance the economy, well-being, the planet. It's the start, and we've had a, a amongst all the turmoil and bereavement and sadness we've had an opportunity to go oh wow like so the world can be different and that's a gift what we do with that gift i think is is up to all of us as as leaders and if we can carry that through and secondly just um from a leadership level you know the the rise the rise of community collaboration has been incredible and there's so much to learn from that there's so much to learn from um how we organize what it means to like know your neighbor and what that means from a business point of view right so how you uh, see your em employees as part of their communities as well as uh, as well as your employee and what does it mean to like be a really good uh, boss in that context what does it mean to help that person to nurture their full life so they can bring their best self to work as well um and and i think that goes back to that thing about trust you know how can we trust people that are going to do their work at home you know, people who are fulfilled and enjoy their jobs and tr and their employer trusts them and invests in them and cares about them in a rounded way, you know, are never going to just shirk work for the sake of it. So I think it's the question of how we carry that on is really important. But it gives me great hope because we've got to see a taste of it. We've got to see a taste of it. And once you've seen it, you can think you start to believe, OK, this this was plausible. You know, before it was impossible. Now, how do we make this normal? How do we make things that were previously impossible a bit more plausible and, and take that forward? You know, it's that cycle. We just need to make sure we keep building on that. So, yeah, I'm excited and, and very hopeful. I just um, I hope we can all step up to it. Right. Your turn day, you get uh, the joy uh, or the pressure of, of going last. What, what gives you hope in terms of uh, the new leadership foundations we've built over the last uh, 13 weeks? I I think I, I was jotting down and 
Amy's touched upon them, that encouragement for people to bring their whole selves to work. We talk about it quite often, but what do we mean by that? And I think during COVID, we've really had to bring our whole selves to work. So whether that's I'm doing homeschooling, I'm caring, um, you know, uh, I've got somebody who's ill in hospital, I've got somebody who's passed away. We've seen everything of everybody we've we've shared in all of these experiences and people have really brought their whole selves to work and i think it's going forward it is about that empathic empathetic empathetic leadership i think as leaders we're going to have to you know engage in the stuff about people's home lives whereas you know in the past maybe leaders have shied away from that and i i think that's really 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 important um also, just to touch on the Black Life Matters, um, I have this feeling that, you know, maybe it's a positive thing. It's happened whilst we have been in lockdown. Why? Because I guess there's a, you know, we're pinned to the news and so on. and We're really consuming what has happened. Um, and, and the fact is, everybody is talking about it. So when people have got together in big groups, it's been about Black Lives Matters and, and that movement. And therefore, the conversation is happening. People are attending webinars such as this. The issue is being raised. And so in a way, the conversation is happening. It, there's less opportunities for people to avoid the conversation, um, if you want to put it that way. So I'm really excited about what the future looks like. It will definitely look different to the future of uh, the, the, what we've left behind. Um, I, I, I'm just so excited about what we can achieve and what Birmingham will look like in the next you know, three to five years. We've got a great opportunity, Birmingham. Let's really not throw it away. Great. Thank you, Sunday. Thank, thank you to all our panel, to Emmy and to Louise, for um, fantastic insights and thoughts and comments and openness uh, throughout the last hour and a half. I hope you've uh, enjoyed watching it. Those of you who've managed to stay with us for the last uh, hour and a half, uh, far too many things to, to try and unpack and to try and condense into a sort of a, a nice, neat closing summary. But I will just say, I think uh, a couple of things that shine out for me is that the if, if it was still around before, Surely now the time and the era of heroic leadership is is over. Uh, leaders can't be heroes anymore. They can't be all knowing and all powerful. Uh, we need a more collaborative uh, form of leadership where words like care and compassion and support come far more into the frame. Uh, but also perhaps as I'm a comms person, I'll, I'll go back to one of your Tunde's first uh, traits of leadership, which was about authenticity. And authenticity, I think, is the greatest ingredient a leader can have um, uh, and hard to regain if you if for some reason you lose it but we've seen I think through all walks of life some great authenticity in leaders and obviously sometimes not such great authenticity. Uh, I will hand over to Chris who will light himself back up again from Conwell Bid to wrap us up. All I will say is I'm grateful for two things. A that I managed to put the power back into the laptop just in time and be that my children who are homeschooling managed to stay out of the office for an hour and a half even though it sounded quite noisy downstairs uh thank you to the panel uh thank you for staying with us and chris i'll hand back to you thanks for organizing us all and uh, let you uh, finish us all off thanks very much um yeah so just to to continue kevin's point thank you everybody one for joining us today thank you to the panel and to kevin as well really appreciate um your participating in sort of this important conversation um, as nicola said at the start it's the second in a series of events we've got going on as part of Birmingham's recovery plan um, the bid itself is working on its own guidance for the district and we have quite a lot of resources on our website about the return back to the city centre, what we're doing as a bid but how um, businesses within the district can support each other as well so I'd recommend you um, go and check that out if you haven't already. Um, next week we're back sort of, I feel like a TV presenter now but we're back the same time next week uh, with our homelessness uh, debate as well and the week after we'll be doing a transport debate as well. Um, again, very important topic um, at the moment, particularly around car parks, clean air in the city, because obviously cars have been off the road for a considerable amount of time. Um, so how can we continue that to make uh, Birmingham a better place moving forward? Um, so yeah, thank you all again. Um, we've recorded this, so it'll be up on YouTube later on today, hopefully, once I've uh, edited it. Um, if you want to replay them, any key points, um, yeah, and uh, hopefully see you all very soon. Thanks.